darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Another lovely day begins with ghosts and ghouls with greenish skin. Good evening. I'm Alex, and I have taken this channel to Haunted Hill so we all can have a party. You're all invited to the top 10 favorite, and from what I believe are the best performances by some of the greatest actors of all time. There will be food, drink, some ghosts, and maybe a few murders, and egg exactly. I have seen every film attainable, keyword attainable, of these terrifyingly brilliant artists. So every list here comes from truthful, sophisticated, and spooky accuracy. My dear friends, happy Halloween, and my spine is just tingling about today's episode on one of the true greats of horror. But make no mistake, he has also graced our presence in hundreds of films, TV shows, and pop music. Get your mustaches ready, for we are talking about the master of the macabre, Vincent Price. Born in St. Louis, Missouri, the youngest of four, with his mother being a costume designer and father, Vincent Price Sr., being the president of the National Candy Company, which was later bought out by Royal, and his grandfather being the inventor of Dr. Price's baking powder. I mean, come on, candy and horror films, it's like the man was destined to be a household name every Halloween. Vincent definitely grew up with such privilege that he graduated from Yale with a degree in English and a minor in art history. Full on fact, Vincent Price was an avid art collector and art historian and could talk for hours about art. He ventured out to London to study it more intensely and more schooling, but was bit literally by the acting bug and made his acting debut in 1935 at the Gates Theatre at the humble age of 24 when he then took on the role of Prince Albert in the play Victoria Regina, which was then moved to Broadway with Helen Hayes acting opposite him. He became so popular on stage that he even worked with Orson Welles with the famous Mercury Theater, then went on to do Angel Street, Gaslight, and many more, which years later he would play Oscar Wilde in a traveling show called Diversions and Delights. But you remember what happens when you become a rising star and consistent working actor in New York, right? Yes, yes, yes. Hollywood takes notice and you begin a whole new life and career that will shape your life forever. And in the name of Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, Vincent Price is not what you would call a Hollywood star per se, like Cary Grant or Ronald Coleman, even though those two men were major influences and personal favorites of Vincent's. But Vincent was certainly one of a kind that audiences would hold more dearly. It's an amazing thing for those of you who know how Vincent could start out his career as a perfect character actor, and for almost 20 years of that, to then transition into being one of the greatest leading men in horror films ever. With a stature of six foot four, he wasn't exactly getting leading man roles right off the bat, but his Shakespearean-like cadence and stern facial structure, he was perfect for period pieces. And it wouldn't be until the late 1950s where producers recognized how powerful of a force he would be as a true leading man for dark, intense, and yet fun stories. With his heavy influence in horror, he was given one of the greatest nicknames ever, the Master of the Macabre, as well as the Father of Horror Movies and Master of Menace. And there's no denying of how much he owns that title with that caliber of performances he has given over his five decades in the picture business. You know I only cover films here, my friends, right? But we must never forget the amazing appearances he has made on tons of TV shows like Rod Serling's Night Gallery, which is spectacular, Time Express, The Brady Bunch, but also the classic short-lived series, The Hilarious House of Frightenstein, which if you have not seen any of their 130 episodes, it is a ghoulishly fun time with Vincent Price narrating on top of the short TV segments he did called Read, Write, and Draw, and his iconic appearance on The Muppet Show, not to mention Sesame Street creating his own Muppet named Vincent Twice, Vincent Twice. Also, I would be remiss if I forgot his egg-tastic appearance as the great egghead 
on the 1960s Batman series, which I love every egg in time. Famously, of course, Vincent gives us the ultimate chills and scares with his closing monologue of Michael Jackson's iconic number, Thriller. If I wasn't a Michael Jackson fan, I would listen to that song over and over just because of Vincent alone. So as you can already see, the man is already a living legend even past death. And to narrow down a top 10 of Vincent's phenomenal performance has been absolute madness. But it must be done. Otherwise, the ghosts will come out for me. So it's time to lock up the house, for the party is just beginning as we scream about the top 10 best performances of The Big Daddy, the father of horror films, the master of the macabre and menace, Vincent Price. Starting off at number 10, we have The Abominable Dr. Fibes, which here we go. I already know there are those of you that are flabbergasted by its placement at number 10. But you know that only means there are plenty other classics to talk about. And with this classic, folks, we're talking primo, campy, horror comedy of Vincent Price. Produced by basically Vincent's home production company he's worked at for two decades, American International Pictures. He plays the abominable doctor himself who seeks revenge for the nine doctors he holds responsible for the death of his wife. And he strategizes every one of their deaths with such methods like bats, bees, a frog mask, all representing the biblical plagues of Egypt. Marketed as Vincent Price's 100th film he's done by the time of 1971, the film was a good box office hit, thanks to the magnitude of Vincent Price, of course. And Dr. Fibes is one of the great classic examples of how genius Price was at combining pathos with comedy and also giving us great picturesque acting without delivering any dialogue for the first 32 minutes of the film. And everything we get from Price is said with his body language and face. Reportedly, this was one picture he had so much fun because co-star Joseph Cotton couldn't stop making him laugh, which I always love and appreciate. It was followed by a not-so-fun sequel, Dr. Fibes Rises Again, even though Price was always consistently great. But to this day, retrospectively, Dr. Fibes' organ playing, his nasty humor, lives on in classic horror because of Price's delicious wit and captivatingly lived-in performance. Number 9, The Comedy of Terrors. This 1963 classic features Vincent as Waldo Tremble. Tremble? I said Tremble. A bitter undertaker who's losing out on business, so he and his little toady, played brilliantly by Peter Lorre, insist on killing people so they can pay their rent and increase their funeral business. Obviously, Price didn't just have campy horror films, serious horror films, but intentionally funny horror comedies like this raucously hilarious good time of a film and Vincent Price just literally kills it as the unstable bumbling undertaker and of all the four films he and Peter Lorre worked on together their chemistry together here extend the most and as much as I love them in Tales of Terror with the wine competition scene god it's so great this definitely helps with the writing and also if you have a seasoned veteran not just of Laurie, but Price's stature, not to mention Boris Karloff and Basil Rathbone in hilarious career best performances as well. You have a comedy of pure gold. Vincent Price apparently said it was one of the most enjoyable sets he'd ever worked on, thanks to the cast and crew, but also thanks to the almost professional comedic timing from himself. Number eight, his kind of woman. Okay, again, I know this must be a completely surprising entry as well. But my friends, remember when Vincent Price started out as a supporting character actor? Well, this 1951 film noir gem features, honest to God, one of the best damn comedic performances Vincent Price has ever given to film. And it was a surprise to me, let me tell you. He plays Mark Cardigan, literally a ham actor that comes in contact with Dan Milner played by Robert Mitchum. And Dan is caught in between a crime boss and Jane Russell. This movie produced by Howard Hughes had some production problems. Ugh, let's let's uh, put it that way. With switching directors, reshooting the whole damn picture, Vincent Price, in my opinion, is the shining star in the whole 
mess of a film because every scene he has, whether he's delivering Shakespeare and his wife is rolling her eyes, Hamlet again, to the greatest sequence when he's sailing his motorboat to save Mitchum and then sinks to the bottom with no change of expression. And he says, now would I give a thousand furlongs of sea from an acre of barren ground. <laughs> he has all the perfect lines and exchanges like with Mitchum, when Mitchum says, I'm too young to die. How about you? Too well known. Well, if you do get killed, I'll make sure you get a first-rate funeral in Hollywood at Grauman's Chinese Theater. I've already had it. My last picture died there. Vincent is just perfect in this role, and Howard Hughes loved his performance so much, which is why they expanded his performance even more so for this parody of a film noir. It should always be known how usually perfect he was off camera because of its production issues. Vincent offered to throw a one year anniversary party on set for the cast and crew because of the long year of filming. I implore you all to catch Vincent in this slightly unintentionally comic classic for yes, Mitchum and Russell, but most of all for Price. Number seven, Laura. My Lord. Please forgive me, my friends. I know, I know, and hear me out. Should Vincent Price's brilliant supporting performance as rich playboy Shelby Carpenter, who doesn't know a lot about anything, but knows a little about practically everything, be much higher? Let's not be psychiatric, Waldo, but in a word, yes. But remember, my friends, I go by performance and not the film itself. That's definitely saved for the director when I cover them in the future. It's no secret, though, that Fox's 1944 classic film noir based on the novel by Vera Kasperi is one of the greatest film noirs of all time and argued by some the best. So you can clearly understand why Vincent Price himself has often claimed Laura as being the film he was most proud being part of and made. And his brilliant performance is nothing to push aside by any means at all. We always give high praise to Gene Tierney, Dana Andrews, and Oscar nominee Clifton Webb, of course. But you can never forget the final piece of the mystery puzzle that is Vincent as Shelby, who is indeed a suspect in the mysterious murder of Laura, because he is quite conventional. Every scene between Vincent and the beautifully underrated Gene Tierney is so lusciously beautiful and funny, thanks to Vincent's perfectly posh and comic timing. They have excellent chemistry together, being the second out of four films they appeared together. And the same goes for the rest of the cast, without a doubt. Fox unfortunately cut a little musical sequence of Vincent singing You'll Never Know and playing the piano, and was once rumored by the public relations department from Fox that Vincent Price would become the next Perry Como. So sad that never came to fruition. But yes, in all the great supporting performances that Vincent has given and known for since the beginning of his career, his performance as Shelby Carpenter will always be his best, indeed. And if you fight me on that, I can afford a blemish on my character, but not on my clothes. Number six, The Baron of Arizona. Here is yet another hidden classic I wish could be much higher, because here we have Vincent Price in such a fantastic and thoroughly genuine leading performance as real-life swindler James Rivas, who forced documents to receive grants and claim ownership of Arizona being the Baron before it could receive statehood. Question is, how long can he continue lying his way with power? Co-written and directed by Samuel Fuller and gorgeous cinematography by James Wong Howe, we see Vincent Price in such a different kind of role, blending Vincent's consistent charm with great heart. You absolutely love his introductory shot in the frenzied rain. Thanks again, Wong Hao and Fuller. And as the story progresses, we get the real chance to see Price give a gripping and captivating three-dimensional performance. The movie itself is structured sloppily, quite honestly, but that doesn't matter. Vincent Price makes this film all the while worth it by his sheer brilliance. Just look at the grand finale when he talks his way out of his lynching. His monologue is one of the best he's ever given on film. At a time when supporting roles was his game, he gained huge momentum and respect with this major leading role. He had other leading roles previously, obviously, but at the time of 1950, there was nothing as strong as his 
prepossessing portrayal here that was originally going to be played by Edward G. Robinson. Whenever Vincent Price was asked about his favorite roles, he always gave a list of favorites. And among the top picks he chose was his phenomenal portrayal right here. Number five, House on Haunted Hill. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you probably really detest me right now. <laughs> you probably want to serve me arsenic on the rocks. I know it's such a shocker to have this at number five, but it had to be here. Granted, House on Haunted Hill was the first real exposure for me to the legendary Vincent Price, as sure as it is for tons of people across the globe. And this film became a Halloween classic staple for my household ever since. Just from the brilliant teaser trailer, introducing us to Vincent Price, inviting us to a party for his wife. She's so amusing. Filled with ghosts after seven people. Won't you come and make it eight? Directed by the great gimmicky director of B-movies, William Castle. The man and Vincent Price made this a classic for the ages, thanks to his Emergo gimmick with a skeleton flying out over the audience at picture showings and the magnitude of Vincent Price that honestly at times looks like he's at his mugging best to the audience. You can tell that this haunted house story is just full of over the top fun. So much fun that even riff tracks wanted to get in on the jokes. I mean, my lord, with the secret passage wall tapping sequence when Carolyn Craig is tapping and then surprise! Old woman just silently growling and then just skateboards her way off screen. It's freaking hilarious, but also the timing of it is a good jump scare. Not this quack, 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 bang nonsense you see today in horror films. Jesus Christ. Anyway, Vincent makes it just so effortless and adds nothing but fun, especially when you have lines like, make a good headline, Playboy kills wife with champagne cork. And the scenes between he and Carol Omart are deliciously wicked. She's so amusing. They try their best to make a decent remake in 1999. And while I admit some parts of that are amusing and enjoyable, Jeffrey Rush, what are you doing, man? Why are you trying to be Vincent Price with literally your character's last name being Price? There can only be one Vincent. And his performance here as Frederick Lauren has often become the poster child of Vincent's legacy in horror, which is not a bad and unfair representation at all. But with all the amazing performances he's given, I wonder how it will end. Number four, House of Usher, or also known as The Fall of the House of Usher, based on the classic short story by the gothically romantic and famous Edgar Allan Poe, and was the very first of eight Edgar Allan Poe film adaptations made by the Pope of Pop Cinema, Roger Corman, starring Vincent Price as Brother Roderick Usher in a truly terrifying performance as he begrudgingly welcomes his new brother-in-law to be, played by Golden Globe winner Mark Damon, to the desolate and quite homey family mansion to marry Madeline, Roderick's sister. But slowly, Mark Damon realizes a family curse has been living within this family which is why Roderick wants his sister to have nothing to do with Damon, since the curse could be afflicted onto him. So Roderick must do whatever he can to lift the curse before it's too late. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of all the Edgar Allan Poe, Roger Corman, and Vincent Price collaborations, they made seven, to be exact, with The Raven, The Pit and the Pendulum, The Haunted Palace, which I love, Tales of Terror, The Mask of the Red Death, and Tomb of Lygia, which are all fan frickin tastic in their own iconic way, House of Usher certainly remains the best, not just for Roger Corman as a director, but for Vincent Price. The film is so powerful, and Price's performance is so damn spine-tingling that I really wish it was much higher as well. For anyone of any age, his performance as Roderick can scare the hell out of you, and intentionally so. With its budget of only $300,000, a third of that being Vincent Price's salary, Roger Corman is able to pull off a phenomenally moody and spooky haunted house story, which has its fair share of frights. Granted, it's still a Roger Corman film, so there are things that are quite cheesy. L l l let's not be too coy about this. And Richard Matheson's writing doesn't exactly emulate Poe's 
poetry. But that's what's always charming about these film adaptations during the 60s, right? And when you have a masterful and serious portrayal from Price, you can't go wrong. Price dedicated even more to this role with dyeing his own hair and losing more weight so that Roderick could look more emaciated and pale. Of course, everyone is talking about the new miniseries on Netflix, but in my opinion, watch the classic 1960 film for the breathtaking bits in Price as he really displays in full form how he is the master of the macabre. Number three, House of Wax. That's right, my Marie Antoinette's. I find Vincent Price's brilliant portrayal as Professor Henry Gerard, owner of the famous Wax Museum, even better than his fun and iconic portrayal in House on Haunted Hill, mainly because his performance is just masterful. It honestly rivals the next top two. He is ever so suave, so sophisticated, so Shakespearean, hence making his character ever so tragic. Basically remade from Warner Brothers, 1933 classic, The Mystery of the Wax Museum, but this time in 3D, which was pointless. But anywho, we have Price as Jared, who has his beautiful and honorable wax museum, and he refuses to give in to his partner's greedy commercialism. So his partner sets his museum on fire, so he can get the insurance money for a commercial house of horrors. Come to find out there is a mysterious cloaked man robbing corpses and murdering people. And wouldn't you know it? Jared survived the fire and agrees to carry on the chamber of horror as long as he creates his long-awaited wax figure of Marie Antoinette, which he believes can be achieved with the help of Sue Allen, played begrudgingly by Phyllis Kirk, and also with the help of Igor, played by a young Charles Buczynski, later known as... Charles Bronson. I don't need to tell you, my friends, that House of Wax is truly one of the greatest horror films of all time, being one of the first films ever to produce the 3D gimmick and profiting amazingly for Warner Brothers. So much so, they decided to remake this one again 52 years later with uh, Paris Hilton, which has some funny moments of death, like her death scene. Ha, that's hilarious. But all in all, is pointless and stupid as hell. Because you know what's missing? Vincent. Vincent Price makes every single bit of this thriller so much fun, so enthralling, and truly terrifying. I am captivated to the soul every time he gives the epic line, once in his lifetime, every artist feels the hand of God and creates something that comes alive. Or how about the shocking climax when he has Sue cornered and says, Everything I have ever loved has been taken away from me. But not you, my Marie Antoinette, for I will give you eternal life. And she pounds at his face, cracking and breaking his lifelike wax face, revealing his burned flesh. The score and direction definitely are effective, but it's Price who always heightens the drama and makes you believe every inch of his character's objective. What a perfect opportunity for Price with this role, for it rejuvenated Price's career after being constantly cast as the supporting actor and never really getting more opportunities in the lead role. Even though House on Haunted Hill was the big punch in his career for consecutive horror films, five years earlier, we were all blessed with his performance, which honestly put him on the horror map and should always be honored as such. Number two, The Great Mouse Detective. That's right, the highly, highly underrated Disney classic take on Sherlock Holmes with Basil of Baker Street having to take on the case for a little girl named Olivia with her father who's gone missing. And with the help of Dawson, the clues may lead to Basil's arch enemy, Professor Rattigan. Absolutely brilliantly voiced by Vincent Price. Co-directed by Ron Clements, who would go on and direct uh, a few other little classics for Disney, like, uh, oh, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, to name a few. This film is one of the dear favorites of my personal childhood, not to mention for countless others around the world. As a film itself, it is such a fantastic nod to Sherlock Holmes, through and through. And when you have Price giving it such gravitas and weight to it, you have the utmost respect for it. His casting story is fantastic, as the producers watch the Ronald Coleman classic, Champagne for Caesar, which is great, as a model for Basil. 
they realized Vincent Price was in the movie and thought, oh my God, he would be perfect for Radigan. Where before, Radigan's design was to be thin and meeker, with Price in the role, he was larger than life. Like Robin Williams for Aladdin and countless others, the animators sketched Vincent's exaggerated Shakespearean gestures and worked them into the animated poses for Radigan. Side note, was anybody else traumatized when, spoiler alert, Fidget was thrown off the Zeppelin by Radigan and because Fidget had a broken wing, he couldn't fly and then plummets down to the river? Who else thought Fidget straight up died? Because I always thought that and it killed me as a kid. I'm like, they straight up killed characters in this one. Anyway, one of my favorite songs I always love listening to, of course, is Radigan's great classic, The World's Greatest Criminal Mind, or what I always known as, Oh Radigan, Oh Radigan. <laughs> and though Vincent is pulling a Rex Harrison and speech singing, it is still such a fantastic song because of how much Vincent puts into it. Vincent has said it was such a lifelong dream to voice a Disney character, and in my opinion, I feel I'm not alone. He gave us one of the greatest... Disney villains that we never thought we could get. I mean, who cannot have a blast playing the world's greatest rat? <laughs> what did you call me? Damn, Vincent, you are just great. And now, my ghouls and goblins, here are some honorable mentions. Edward Scissorhands. Yes, I can't help myself, my friends. This Tim Burton classic remains one of my all-time favorite childhood films, which was technically my second exposure to the man, Vincent Price, after House on Haunted Hill, of course. Anyone who's anyone remembers Price as the great inventor who created Edward, apparently adding the heart of a cookie. It's no surprise that Tim Burton was heavily inspired and a fan of Vincent Price growing up, so much that one of Tim Burton's short films, Vincent, was based on a young idealist who idolized Vincent Price, and better yet, Vincent Price actually narrated the short. It's a delightful short when you get the chance to watch it. According to Price himself, that short to him was, and I quote, the most gratifying thing that ever happened. It was immortality, better than a star on Hollywood Boulevard. So of course, Price would return for a feature length film of Burton with a role written specifically for him. However, his role had to be cut down due to his illness of emphysema and Parkinson's, but he absolutely makes such an impact that you can never forget him. My God, just the small scenes where Price is reading Edward poetry, and when he gives Edward's hands as a Christmas present, but, spoiler alert, dies before he could repair them, is heart-wrenching magic. Any 90s kid like me, or of any age, should never forget Edward Scissorhands. Witchfinder General, or also known as Matthew Hopkins, colon, Witchfinder General, and sometimes as the Conqueror Worm, which is very interesting. If you've seen it, whew, what a fun and fancy free movie, yeah? Price is at it again with honestly one of the most devastatingly brutal performances of his career. This one based on real life witch hunter. Matthew Hopkins during the English Civil War, who lies about his position appointed by Parliament to hunt down sorcery and practically commit genocide against anyone who is a witch. The making of this film is definitely wild, with constant clashing between Price and its director, a 24-year-old Michael Reeves. Reeves was very, shall we say, forward with how much Price was not his first choice for the role of Hopkins. But with AIP involved, Price was usually going to get leading man work. And so continued a tyrannical treatment of Price on set, with Price getting hurt on the first day and Reeves not giving a crap. Once the final product came out, Price grew to respect Reeves since he figured out finally what he was looking for. And at this time, we had a lot of fun and campy Price performances in horror, but this film was going to be a return to form in such a dry and vicious fashion. The film itself is so brutal and suffocating that I, I can't even watch it anymore. But on that note, it is also why Price has often cited his chilling performance as Hopkins among his best in horror. The Tingler. Now on the opposite side of serious horror, we have 
Camp Horror back at it again among its finest, reteaming with director William Castle right after A House on Haunted Hill. Price is an obsessed pathologist who finds a parasitic centipede-like creature living inside all of us, which is called the Tingler, which feeds on fear. If we don't let out that fear, then the Tingler will take our lives. And the only way we can stop it is if we do not panic, but scream, scream for your lives. Built around being another device, of course, we have William Castle introducing us to the power of the Tingler. And remember to scream, because your life depends on it. And for the classic movie theater sequence, Castle even implanted little buzzers on certain seats to give authenticity to the Percepto. And the bloody bathtub scene is genius too. Price is fantastically committed, as always, and this will always be a dear, special film in my heart, since it is a favorite of my mother's, and we used to watch it quite a lot when I was growing up. And for I love watching Vincent Price in these kind of fun and tingling elements. The Wales of August, a lovely independent gem of a film based on the play by David Barry with Vincent, perfectly cast as Mr. Marinoff, who travels in from Russia and is still grieving from his lost friend and almost liberated with the newly found friendship with the two sisters he met who also live at their summer home in Maine and will bring him much more healing and peace especially when it lives in his heart so immediately. The chemistry between all four actors, Price, Betty Davis, Lillian Gish, and Oscar nominee Anne Southern is so precious, with Vincent earning an Independent Spirit Award nomination for his performance, and rightfully so, for his character is very much like a character out of a Chekhov play, with such wit about him, but a quiet sadness within him. It's such a powerfully moving performance no one should get tired of. Dragon Wick. Oh, what a fantastically gothic period drama this is, based on the book as well, with Vincent Price giving a beautifully understated, genuine, real leading performance as Nicholas, a distant cousin of Miranda, played magnificently by Jean Tierney, who is invited to come live with Vincent Price and his family in Hudson, New York, at the Dragon Wick Mansion, but Miranda comes to realize that Nick has more scandalous intentions than anticipated. Vincent is so damn brilliant in this film that is otherwise a little tedious, but Vincent and Jean together make it so worth it. And Vincent had to work hard to convince first-time director Joseph Mankiewicz that he was the right man for the job. So Vincent lost 30 pounds and gave the performance that was perfect for Nick. Gregory Peck would have been great, but no. The character of Nick needed someone with darkness in their eyes, someone who could lean into the tragedy of Nick, being an opium addict and wanting to escape the pain of his life. In the humble year of 1946, when this was released, you can say that the darkened edge of horror for Price was somewhat implanted in the minds of audiences starting from this film. And by Jove, are we devilishly thankful for it. Number one, Theater of Blood. Ladies and gentlemen, this must be a surprise of sorts. If it is, I implore you, implore you, especially this Halloween, take another defining look at what I sincerely believe is the grand prize performance of Vincent Price's career for it encapsulates everything that made Vincent popular and a legend. His darkened and sinister flavor he gave to his characters in horror and his perfect blend of dark humor on top of his utterly Shakespearean cadence. That's right, this film, if you haven't seen it, features all of Vincent at his best as he plays Edward Lionheart, a faded, well, presumably dead Shakespearean actor who has been humiliated and ridiculed by critics of his performances. And after he is saved by certain vagrants in London, after trying to commit suicide, he devises a master plan to kill the critics one by one in sadistic and Shakespearean ways. Literally since each death comes from a death written and performed in Shakespeare's plays. And before they meet their demise, 
Edward gives them a soliloquy of their review of his previous performance. Now, if that doesn't sound like a freaking amazing time, I, I can't help you, my friends. <laughs> More than a horror film, this was definitely a black comedy. And so Vincent obviously was on cloud nine doing this picture because it was finally, finally his chance to do Shakespeare and playing various famous roles of Shakespeare like Shylock in Merchant of Venice, Brutus in Julius Caesar, Richard III, Titus Andronicus, and more, not to mention Butch, the gay hairdresser. Hey, dishy, dishy hair. Can't wait to get my hands on it. Plus, he was able to work with some of the greatest British actors at the time some of which trained with the Royal Shakespeare Company, which he always wanted, including Dame Diana Rigg playing his daughter, Edwina. So many hilarious moments too, when he's sawing off the critic's head and he pauses for a moment, waiting for the napkin to wipe the sweat off his brow, then returns back to the body. <laughs> the original title was supposed to be called Much Ado About Murder, which is great, but Theater of Blood is just way better. Often seen as a companion piece to the abominable Dr. Fives, with his revenge story, but this revenge tale takes the bloody cake, for we all are graced with Vincent's overjoyed and powerful performances that will stand the test of time within horror. He has often said his performance in this film was his favorite. I always love when artists rate certain performances of their own and which ones stuck closer to them. And like many good artists would do, they would name countless pictures they did among their favorites because it just shows how much they just love what they do. And Vincent no doubt adored what he did as an actor. Did he feel a little pigeonholed by the 60s in primarily doing horror? Yes, you can say that. But at this day and age, if you get any notice and attention, especially high praise for a certain genre, that's one of the greatest things that can happen to you. But Vincent even said himself, it's just as fun to scare than to be scared because at least Vincent made such a name for himself and inspired countless many to just become filmmakers of horror, like Tim Burton, of course, not to mention inspiring the look of Marvel's classic superhero, Doctor Strange. That's right, Vincent Price's likeness was very much the basis of the character. We have to be grateful for all the good Vincent has done too, with supporting the gay rights movement, opening an art museum and gallery called the Vincent Price Gallery at the East LA Community College to focus on the preservation of fine art, writing dozens of cookbooks and would often cook meals for his co-stars. He certainly wasn't perfect, but his body of work in film and pop culture leaves such a high mark. His name is one of the most beloved names to celebrate. On top of the fact he passed away on October 25th, just six days before the big day. The man was such an icon that I proudly scream out his name in horror and enjoyment. Because I'm a firm believer we would not have the charming fun we have today in horror had it not been for this master of the macaw. Is there no end to your horrors? No, none whatever. But tell me, my ghostly guests, do you agree with my picks? What are your favorite performances by the master of menace, the father of horror movies, the master of macabre? Don't be shy at all. I love to hear your devilish thoughts. And if you do like this, oh, please click like, subscribe, and ring that bell until you scream. But for more bonus content and exclusive voting power, Visit the Patreon page because any support you offer comes back deadfold. I mean fivefold. And until next time, my friends, thank you so very much for watching, you ghouls and goblins. And also, don't stay up thinking of ways to get rid of me. It makes wrinkles.